He has written an underwater adventure for Radio National. It was titled, My First Book of Strange Fish, and has just completed writing his memoirs called Fraudulent Recollections. And on that topic, uh, Marty describes his hobbies as lying, collecting bogus theories and distorting matters of historical record, which he intends to share with us tonight. Uh, his idiosyncratic uh, research into the life and times of the great Australian artist Rupert Bunny, a painter, spiritualist, and an early adopter of modern technologies, as he describes. Could you please all join me in welcoming Marty Murphy with his talk. <laughs> Overdressed for picnics while the world prepared for war. Good evening, lovers of art, and thank you in advance for staying in your seats. Tonight, I would like to place the artist Rupert Charles Wollstone Bunny, 1864 to 1947, into context of the times and places he lived in. Not that he was a time traveller. That's not what I meant at all. Um, it may have sounded like I was trying to suggest that Rupert Bunny was a time traveller. He was not, officially, and most experts would agree he was merely an Australian artist who enjoyed great success in Paris during and after and a bit before the period known as the Belle Epoque, or beautiful era, which we enjoyed here under the brand name of the Edwardian era, or unattractive English monarch period. <laughs> Naturally, we have proof that Bunny was a painter. As should be obvious to you by now, there is an exhibition of his paintings downstairs, and not a time machine, which is also why I am talking to you today at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, and not the Powerhouse Museum. Of course, it is possible that Bunny did some time traveling, as there were many inventions coming out at the period. Um, but it is unlikely. So please don't bring it up again. <laughs> or at least, that is the attitude you would normally get from art historian expert professors with degrees of some sort. What I want to do today, apart from sit down and take a good hard look at myself after this talk, is describe the privileged society of Australia's first hit painter. An artist who slapped the canvas in a Europe full of absinthe-fueled picnics against a background of rising militarism and shifting geopolitical seating arrangements. <laughs> During the end of this last age of imperialism, new modern conveniences were taken up by the chattering classes who chatted drank and overdressed for picnics, unless they went topless, which, judging by the works downstairs, they did early and often. <laughs> Europe was a fermenting, sterling silver soup terrine of finely diced ideologies and saturated armaments. Bunny's works ranged from grand compositions uh, to highly decorative scenes of feminine intimacy and voluminous haberdashery, often using figurative clones of his wife, Jeanne. Now, for all this and his connections to the underworld, Bunny became a key player in the modern art movement, as I will elaborate on shortly after first making a poo joke. <laughs> and like any artist who has a lot of wind blown up his ass, he was susceptible to fads and causes which were just as common in the pre-T-shirt era as they are today. For example, the pioneering dietitian, Dr. Adolf Harzbeiter, a prominent figure in the intestinal movement of the late 19th century, was a radical advocate of fibre in the diet, or fibronics. His seminal work, published in 1888, The Origin of Feces, was <laughs> popular reading among the Bohemians of Paris. 
the fact that Hard's biter choked to death on a coconut husk in 1903 did nothing to diminish his reputation. Rupert Bunny was one of several famous artists to attend his funeral and subsequent wake, which was highly regarded for its astonishing variation of flavoured linseed cakes. <laughs> but what you may not be aware of is that Rupert Bunny, Edwardian beach bum and picnic enthusiast, was both an amateur spiritualist and habitual adopter of modern technology. For example, there is mounting evidence to show that the artist not only attended regular seances to commune with the dead, but also owned not one but three electric irons and a Bakelite dry cell powered portable gyroscope, which he had affixed to his 1912 high wheel motor buggy. As we all know, a gyroscope is essentially a spinning wheel set in a movable frame. When the wheel spins, it retains its spatial orientation uh, despite the external forces applied to it. Very handy, I always carry a spare. <laughs> Traditionally, gyroscopes are used in navigation instruments um, for ships, planes and, and space rockets. Uh, but Dr. Helmut Marwood of the Bruising Institute at Banking Left has surmised that Bunny was following an Edwardian trend of intuitive appliance adaptation. When he attempted to use a gyroscope as a sort of an early GPS sat-nav device, going by various references in his private correspondence to a near-death experience on the road to Tutti Tu, Bunny gave up on the device and decided to use it as a desk ornament instead given that one had to consult maps and make measurements while travelling at speed, he later discredited his own innovation as reckless and too hard. But let's go back in time a few years earlier. Not literally, uh, for according to received wisdom, that's not possible. Our story begins in Melbourne, a city famous for never having been located in Europe, <laughs> um, despite its best efforts. In 1881, Bunny enrolled at the University of Melbourne to study civil engineering. Abandoning his studies in the hope of becoming an actor, but frustrated by family opposition, who knew actors to be habitual liars and deluded fantasists, he eventually joined the National Gallery Schools under O.R. Campbell and G.F. Follingsby, with a view to joining the more respectable ranks of opium-chuffing oil painters. In 1884, he went to London, which for centuries had been full of English people. Bunny enrolled at P.H. Calderon's Art School in St John's Wood, where he was a victim of snide remarks for having large ears. Two years later, he left for Paris to study under Jean-Paul Laurence and drink coffee from a bowl. And Paris was where he would first try to grow a moustache. <laughs> Bunny lived through both world wars but did his best work before the first one. Leaving Melbourne and moving to Paris, where he lived and had his greatest successes, Rupert had little choice to become an artist of some renown, given he was burdened with sounding like he'd been named after somebody's favourite pet. <laughs> his early works were mainly mythological and biblical subjects or symbolist landscapes. He captured supernatural experiences at the beach, usually in winter, Note that the figures are blue tinged with cold. Also, the beaches where these events took place were empty of tourists um, or unwanted extras. Tritons, like mermaids, don't like holiday crowds or warm weather and tend to live most of the summer in the ocean's depths where they have their kingdoms and business franchises. <laughs> but fraternising with mermaids was not what got him into trouble. Works such as Aeneas and the Sibyl at Cumae, 1887, Jacob Wrestling Gabriel, 1892, and The Burial of St. Catherine of Alexandria, 1896, brought Bunny under close scrutiny from authorities in London for their remarkable historical accuracy. Though while he worked in France, he was free to do as he pleased. You see, towards the end of the 19th century, laws were passed banning time travel in both Great Britain and Australia. The Papal Edict of 1898, Sanctitatus Tempestasis, on the sanctity and preservation of the space-time continuum, 
uh, condemned time travel and going back or forth and meddling with affairs of the past or future as interfering with God's work. Inventors and recreational fellow travellers protested their technology was used only for research and matters of historical accuracy in accordance with the industry's strict code of self-regulation. But it was thought by various ruling authorities that the risk to upsetting the laws of the universe, including bylaws and statutes governing our very existence, might come under threat. Thus, secret time traveller organisations were formed around the world, except for France, where it was legal and you could also drink and smoke as much as you liked and not get sick and have sex with everyone. In fact, time travel research was well funded by the French government, uh, but they claimed the science never amounted to much. On the few occasions Bunny was accused of bending time, he, when he was exhibiting both in London and Australia, each charge was eventually dropped, and afterwards his detractors claimed no memory of ever having made the charge in the first place. <laughs> and as for the great time before the Great War, Historical context is necessary when trying to assess any artist, and the more fanciful the better. The Edwardian Belle Epoque, or Belle Epoque, if you didn't take French and still won't, I won't have a bar of them, um, was the time when Bunny got his painting mojo, and was a period of much scientific and technological progress. Although he was seen as somewhat eccentric in that he preferred to paint a clone army of his wife lounging with herself. <laughs> Bunny enjoyed modern conveniences as much as the next middle, uh, middle class oil painter. And indeed, it, it was a time for all sorts of wonderful new pleasures, both around town and in the well-appointed home. The belly poke period was one of great optimism, uh, given so many gadgets had been invented with new telephones, typewriters, sewing machines, motor cars, aeroplanes, gyroscopes and wireless radio flooding the market. It was thought a world war could be avoided due to the availability of such helpful products. And today it is hard to imagine how such a developed society could be in denial of the uh, geopolitical realities around it. Um, other inventions included the coal-powered vacuum cleaner, which created work for itself and was popular amongst obsessive compulsives undergoing the new treatment of psychoanalysis. Um, there was the air conditioner, popular with coal miners unless it was set to recycle. Uh, the fire extinguisher, uh, often sold as part of a twin package with the coal-fired vacuum cleaner. <laughs> There was also household detergent, synthetic ammonia, which was the industrial gas used for hydrogenating oils and brought trans fats to the diet at last. Uh, neon lighting, stainless steel, the brassiere, designed for women but also proving a godsend for men who cross-dressed. Um, and the stainless steel brassiere, which was used mainly by the navy and merchant seamen. Uh, tear gas, AM radio, sonar, which was invented by whales, um, and <laughs> first picked up as an echo in the stainless steel brassiers of cross-dressing naval officers. Uh, the refrigerator, vitamin A and D, but previously sun exposure had no health benefits. Hormones, where would we be without them now? Um, radium, quantum theory, still hardly understood, relativity theory, uh, mostly understood, and second only to quantum as the most highly quoted scientific theory by people who have no idea what they're talking about in social <laughs> gatherings. Oh, and of course, genetic heredity, uh, giving bad behaviour and nasty diseases the excuse they'd been looking for for centuries. <laughs> Technology and prosperity had, for the first time in history, made it possible to believe that utopias were attainable. The result was an ivory inlaid platter of consumable theories, spiritualism, theosophy, eugenics, fibronics, as described earlier, communism, nudism, free love, vegetarianism, and the worship of vitamins. <laughs> Fantasy fiction of the time also showed these influences. Africa, South America, the Arctic, and any other region with some remaining mystery were full of long lost tribes. Bunny family lore has it that a copy of the adventure classic A Calabash of Kumara 
about a constipated Marxist who gets shipwrecked on a South Pacific island and has visions of heaven while on a diet restricted to root vegetables was said to be lent to Rupert one boxing day by his uncle Winter, but was never returned. Which brings me to cellophane. Cellophane, as we have come to know and love, is a thin, transparent and waterproof protective film that is used for packaging of many types. It was invented in 1908 and enjoyed early success as decorative wrapping for transporting cakes and biscuits. For the upper classes of Europe and countries formerly known as colonies of the British Empire, one end unwrapped on a china plate, the various colours available could really hold a picnic rug together. Almost 20 years later, chemists at the DuPont Company made it waterproof, allowing picnic treats during the interwar period to have such additions as jellies and runny custards, which previously demanded the inconvenient hazard of muslin-wrapped fine bone china bowls. So towards the end of that heady decade, just before the roaring 20s broke into the hacking cough that signaled the depression, colour, taste and utility collided for those who could afford it, rushing in a whole new era of perishable picnickery. But if convenience and leisure were the preference of the topless picnicking classes in both Edwardian Australia and belly-poking Paris, was it merely the sake of convenience that Rupert painted his wife over and over rather than hire a few models or get his friends drunk? Was he that lazy? Or could she not bear to have him paint another woman? Did she have so many fabulous outfits they just had to get them all up on the canvas? Or was he merely so obsessed with her that he could not realise another woman's likeness no matter how hard he tried? Was her face really just that easy to paint? And were there meant to be more men in some of the paintings, but they all came out looking like her? <laughs> we shall never know, because at the turn of the century, incisive yet dull art history documentaries with classical music soundtracks had not yet been invented. <laughs> and what of the connection between spiritualism and folding beds? Well, the folding cabinet bed, a space saver that folded up against the wall into a cabinet, was patented in Chicago in 1885. And by the time of the belly poke, Paris, being full of garrets, uh, became an enormous market for them. Bunny had one installed in his first studio on the Rue de Ponce before he moved to larger lodgings on Fifi Square. And it was here that he was introduced to spiritualism through his new landlady, Madame Lola de Spank. <laughs> spiritualism held that the soul survived death and made an immediate transition to the spirit world. Communication with these souls became possible through mediumship. Bunny seems to have had a passing obsession with Napoleon Bonaparte, and for a time he tried contacting the spirit of the tyrant general but instead met with a disappointing series of apparitions who, still insane in the afterlife, merely thought they were the short French general. <laughs> Bunny's interest in spiritualism extended to mesmerism, or paranormal phenomena exhibited by mesmerised or hypnotised subjects. At the time, the public lapped up any daydream as visions of the spirit world, and for a modest licence, free for anyone who had completed kindergarten, you could become a medium and communicate with the dead. Bunny became a talented amateur hypnotist and often put friends under his gaze, told them to disrobe, did a quick life drawing, got them dressed again and brought them back, freaking them out by producing an immediate likeness, an intimate likeness, for which he claimed he possessed X-ray vision, the first X-ray having been produced in 1885. Bunny always had a keen eye for the latest trends in technology and was once kicked out of a car showroom for licking the bonnet of a Renault. But his hypnotic acts of bandit draftsmanship soon proved profitable when he turned his trick to blackmail and extorted money from wealthy patrons whom he sketched in compromising positions, usually holding a portable gyroscope, which became a motif in this extortion series 
Sadly, uh, none of these incriminating pieces have survived intact as their owners invariably destroyed them after the transaction or had them touched up with more flattering anatomical additions. <laughs> the practice of mediumship also included trance messages relayed from the underworld to the assembled participants on subjects ranging from foul deeds of the past to home improvement and dieting tips. Early seances were mostly knocking on wooden surfaces and a few spirit mutterings, mostly bad poetry. But the sessions became more entertaining in order to attract larger audiences. Jeanne Morel, Bunny's wife, was something of a gifted channeler. Seances became highly fashionable and she really knew how to put on a show, once even breaking her own chair under the weight of an obese great aunt she was transmitting at the time. <laughs> to demonstrate proof of the spirit world, mediums giving public performances performed paranormal physical feats, such as levitation, or producing a material object by allegedly occult means, like a carrot pulled from nowhere or causing a spirit to appear in bodily form. Trickery was not uncommon, and when playing a ghost, one had to be careful always to use a clean bed sheet. But exposure to fraud did little to dampen public enthusiasm. Spiritualists such as Despank also conducted private home circles, and it was these that Bunny frequented under the tutelage of his landlady. Note the study for Witches Sabbath, 1887. It depicts a night of pagan rituals, both naughty and nice, reflecting the era's fascination with the occult. Bunny's spiritualist activities were influenced by his Prussian-born mother, Mary Woolston, his classicist tendencies coming from his British-born father, Bryce, influenced more his impulse to travel back in time to sketch the gods of the ancient world and various Old Testament events. His biblical and literary paintings produced from 1889 to 1905, oriented towards melodramatic moments, revolving around the dominant biblical theme of God ultimately getting his own way. But during the 1890s, Bunny also did a series of large canvases, Tritons, Una and the Forms, or more accurately, Una telling off the Forms, Sea Idol, or Beach Bottom, Pastoral, 1893, uh, depicting a garlanded oboist playing what seems to be a rather annoying tune to everyone but his girlfriend, <laughs> while behind them Pan comes down after a big night on the pipes. <laughs> Forerunners to his biblical works, they are peopled with the uh, mythical pagan sea folk who still owned much of the real estate in Brittany and held development at bay well into the 20th century. Bunny was a player in the debate between non-rational and spiritual world versus the positivist presumption that all mysteries and superstitions should be driven from modern life. I agree with both. And for a time, he lived down the road from a stable of centaurs who supplied local providors with venison and the occasional wild boar. They ended up convincing him to not become a vegetarian and instructed him in astrology. And Brittany, where Bunny painted annually from 1887 to the end of the century, was full of fauns, nymphs, and old-fashioned sorcerers. There was a biannual coven held in a forest near the coast, south of Brest, and in 1900, Bunny had a minor, though nasty, spell cast upon him by one Magda Arswide, who felt her privacy invaded when he sketched her without permission one Midsummer Eve. The spell exacerbated his already pronounced buttocks, and it was uncharacteristically insensitive of him not to ask permission first. But rather than make amends, he did not return, and after procuring a reversing spell from a warlock who ran a clinic out of Montmartre, uh, Bunny changed direction with his painting and somewhat hypocritically sought subjects most, uh, more comfortable with their body shape. And this became the Feminine Arcady series. Arcadia was a psychological rather than a temporal state. As they say, absinthe makes the mind go wander. <laughs> At least, that is what social conservatives and prohibitionists would have you believe. Originally maligned as a dangerously psychoactive drug and eventually prohibited in parts of Europe, the United States and those parts of the Commonwealth not already stinkered on gin, 
the green fairy became most popular amongst Bohemians. Works such as Dolce Faniente or Sweet Idleness, A Summer Morning, Summertime, Nocturne and Sunday Afternoon depict the patient boredom of overdressed ladies waiting for someone to turn up with a bottle of fun. <laughs> These works at Bunny's artistic apex depict the life of his wife and friends, except the ones she made him paint out and replace with replicants of herself. <laughs> they epitomise the elegance and charm of the belly poke. A beautiful woman and her clone army, fashionable silk, and the sunny disposition of an endless summer which would end in a war. White swans starting make, started to make an appearance too, uh, able to travel between the spiritual and material world. A bunny tried to keep one as a pet for a time in, until it became unmanageable in his Paris studio, uh, for which he did not uh, require a license, as he would have done in Melbourne, where they were banned, along with ducks and geese, for spraying shit everywhere. This explains the rise of chooks as the dominant fowl in Australian metropolitan centres at the time of Federation. Summertime 1907 features a gathering of strong-jawed clones lounging in or stripping off delicacies of lace, fine linen and silk. As a recurrent motive, it was a kind of lesbianesque arabesque. But could it really have been rayon? <laughs> no. It is likely that the dresses depicted in this series were made of silk and not rayon, a cellulose-based fiber made from wood pulp or cotton waste, invented around 1855, but not produced commercially until 1910. So no, it was silk, and thus, finally, may I put an end to that imagined controversy. <laughs> Bunny later commented that his reason for abandoning female subjects lay in changes to Edwardian and French fashion, where women were banned until the outbreak of World War I, when it was realised that men who had embarked on a worldwide effort to destroy one another needed women to justify themselves to and continue the species. Notwithstanding his wife's centrality as a motive in his art, and she looks decidedly over it in the portrait of the artist's wife, or Are We There Yet? 1917, <laughs> Bunny was probably, very probably, most definitely bisexual, given he painted the gayest Cupid in all Christendom. <laughs> Note how the winged enabler in his 1901 work, An Idol, soon to become a fiddle, leans on one hand with his arrow pointing at his own heart as he gazes longingly at the inner thigh of the sleeping male rather than at the lovers as a couple. They'll be pushing and shoving, but do check it out. <laughs> Rivet Bunny was notoriously sociable and had what was described as an impressive artistic conviviality, sleeping in a blue felt tent at one end of his studio and growing a pet moustache, which he wore everywhere. But he was also described as secretive by one associate, a bit gay, and parts of his life and career remain obscure, attributed to his various periods spent observing ancient Greece and Rome for research purposes. He consciously followed successful trends in Parisian art, and around 1910, when critics started getting smelly with him, he returned to mythological images that were immediately popular in the press. His social circle widened and he became acquainted with celebrities such as actress Sarah Bernhardt. And as all actors were trained in astrology, even to this day, they became regular fixtures at Henri Tickle's tea rooms where they read palms, compared moons and recited tea leaf monologues. It was here that Bunny met sculptor Auguste Rodin, whose nose was later played by Gérard Depardieu in a film about Camille Claudel. After a 27-year absence, in 1911, Bunny returned to Australia for a successful show in Melbourne with over 100 paintings for sale, described at the time as the most important show by a returning Australian artist not depicting shearing or abundant facial hair. <laughs> he was busy on commissioned portraits during this seven-month visit, which included a now-lost large-scale mural, a lifelong ambition, of one Lady Kenneth Heaps of Turak, thought to have been destroyed by an orange candy-striped wallpapering frenzy during an extensive renovation of Heaps' house in the late 1960s. 
The epic work featured Lady Kenneth wearing a grenadier's uniform atop her favourite Shetland pony Byron in a coastal setting. Bunny's return to Paris in 1912 marked a period of crisis and uncertainty with World War I soon shattering an age of elegance, not to mention the approximately 16 million lives it took and 21 million wounded. But he continued to climb, and in this same year he was elected societaire and became a permanent figure of the Parisian art world, giving him a foreign resident dispensation to eat as much soft cheese as he liked without getting fat. By the early 20th century, the party balloon of spiritualism had mostly deflated and assumed the floppy light bulb shape of a worn out idea. The exposures of fraud took their toll and public interest began to wane. When science, pro proved, when science failed to prove spiritualist tenets, which, a hundred years later, won't make a dent in some crackpot cults. World War I brought thousands of the breathed back to seances for a time, but, but 1920, the phantasmic party was over. Though Bunny still maintained a penchant for levitation and was often seen at exhibition openings with a bruised forehead. <laughs> Historians are divided over Bunny. Was it imposing technical skilled or mannered artifice? But it is generally accepted he suffered both anatomical and spatial awkwardness, born with oversized buttocks and a slightly forward curving spine, which was easily disguised by a generous frock coat. A thickened retina in his left eye often caused him to judge objects to be closer than they seemed. Fortunately, the bohemian taste of the period allowed furniture in his studio to be padded with oriental rugs and bamboo cloth, with all sharp corners removed from Turkish trestle tables and his upright piano. His representation of the body and general perspective have been interpreted as both a part of a strategic primitivism and also a congenital condition. His larger mythological paintings of the 1920s were a response to post-war regional painting trips. Around 1925, he painted a self-portrait in Arabic dress, thought at the time to be camp theater, being part gay on his father's side, when it is more likely he simply painted what he was wearing on a time travel survey when he began the work at the time. The year of this painting, he even wrote in his diary of his fondness for an 11th century Persian cheese made by locals with cardamom and goat's milk. Note also that Bunny's self-portraits are consistently framed as medium close-ups, given his anatomical awkwardness from the waist down. The French state ultimately bought 13 of his works, but eventually Mr. Bunny fell into obscurity in France. He spent nearly 50 years as an expat and returned to Australia permanently in 1933 as a widower of nearly 70. Initially somewhat an outsider, as all people returning or migrating to Melbourne are for the first 15 years after their arrival, <laughs> he was regarded as a forerunner of modernism and appointed the position of vice president of the newly formed Contemporary Art Society in Melbourne. Sadly though, not long after this visit, Arthritis and an injury to his right wrist after colliding into a ceiling fan during a levitating mishap <laughs> appeared to have rendered him unable to work. His last years were increasingly devoted to musical composition, composing several ballets and the successful musical Calamine for Clementine, <laughs> about a dancer at the Moulin Rouge trying to advance her career without catching a venereal disease. His final exhibition in Australia was in 1946 at the National Gallery of Victoria, which mounted its first retrospective of a living artist, normally preferring them to be dead or retired in Hobart. <laughs> Rupert Bunny died on the 25th of May, 1947, at St. Hattie of the Blessed Picnics, a private nursing hospital in Melbourne. In his obituary, the Age newspaper described several distinguished looking guests attending his retrospective at the NGA the previous year as wearing what was described as a fancy dress party kaleidoscope of period and ethnic costume with some guests appearing as characters from several of the works themselves, displaying an impressive likeness. It was also reported that as some sort of theatrical statement, these mysterious characters all spoke fluently in what were perceived to be several different foreign languages and archaic dialects, which only Mr. Bunny seemed to understand. 
and it is on that note of mystery and distortion I now leave you to ignore or ponder at your will. Thank you and good night. Thank you.